Hello, this is Kimberly Leonard at Sky News. So as we record this Sky News Daily, there are things we know and a lot we don't know about the latest crisis at the BBC. We know a high-profile presenter has been suspended. We know the corporation had been due to meet police to discuss the allegations made to The Sun, that he paid thousands of pounds to a teenager for explicit photos. Their contact started its claimed when that individual was 17, back in 2020. But we don't know for sure why the star stayed in his job after the first complaint almost two months ago. We don't know whose timeline of events since then is correct, the BBC's or the teenager's mum's account that she gave to The Sun. Whatever the truth, the BBC seems to be facing its biggest scandal in years and a huge test in the relationship it has with its audience, the people who, of course, provide its funding. What damage could this do to the BBC? Later, we'll hear from Roger Bolton, who's a former BBC producer and presenter, who now presents the Beeb Watch podcast. But first, let's speak to our home editor, Jason Farrell. Hi, Jason. Thanks a lot for chatting to us on this. At the time of recording this, we still don't know who this person is. So I think it's worth just going over why. Why is it that they haven't said who this BBC presenter is? Yeah, I mean, there has been a lot of speculation about why hasn't this person been named? People are talking about it on Twitter. They want to know who this presenter is. They want confirmation. Um, But there have been reasons and strong reasons given so far why this person hasn't been named. From the perspective of the BBC, why the BBC hasn't done it, Tim Davey, the Director General, explained in a memo to staff yesterday, actually, and his reasoning was that by law, individuals are entitled to a reasonable expectation of privacy. And certainly if there was an employee being Uh, investigated internally within your company for an allegation made externally. In the initial stages, that would be uh, private, that that internal investigation. And, for example, if it then was a criminal investigation, it would only be when the sort of formal criminal proceedings started that that name would become public. And as we heard from the police yesterday, there actually hadn't been a formal allegation made to the police as of yesterday. We know the BBC are meeting today. I think the other question is, why hasn't the Sun newspaper, who's who's brought this story to everyone's attention, why haven't they named uh, that person? Uh, I heard uh, Kelvin McKenzie, a former editor of the Sun, saying that he, under his editorship, they would have done. Um, and it, it is a decision for the, the newspaper, but obviously the clear thing that they have to worry about are the defamation laws. You know, Do they have enough information? Do they have enough facts out there to be absolutely clear that what they're saying is true? And I think for all the other media outlets who don't have, aren't privy to everything that The Sun has been privy to, they haven't been in conversations with the people making those allegations, it's even more difficult. You know, other media organisations can't suddenly jump to an allegation, even if they've got a pretty good idea who The Sun is talking about, because they don't have um, the information to, 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 pr- to protect themselves against a libel, a, a libel allegation if that were to come from that individual. And there's been a change in privacy laws in recent years, hasn't there? That's right. So you you do have greater protection now against uh, against newspapers uh, bringing out uh, your name uh, in in the public in such a in, in such a way because uh, you know this, this this is the kind of thing as as the point has been made it can ruin careers if uh, if names come out even if the allegations turn out down the line not to be true. You spoke about how it's been playing out on social media, so much speculation. And that has been one of the unintended consequences here, hasn't it? But people have had to come out and defend themselves because everyone's talking about who it is. Well, I think this is the difficulty for the BBC, because not only are their own presenters now obviously coming under scrutiny and over the weekend, various high profile presenters uh, had to come out and say that it wasn't them. Nicky Campbell on his on his program this morning had to say it wasn't him. Jeremy Vine said, you know, I can't believe I'm having to say this, but by the fact that I'm speaking into this microphone tells you that it's not me because we know that this person has been suspended. And, and what that means is, of course, that there was already a relatively short list of presenters who are earning a six-figure salary, as we were told by The Sun, this person is. There's a relatively short list. And as, as, as each presenter comes out and says, it's not me, I'm on air, uh, that list gets shorter. 
Jason, let's have a listen now. You mentioned Nicky Campbell. He mentioned, well, he spoke about the false accusations on his uh, BBC radio show today, this morning, in fact. Let's have a, have a listen to what he said. Obviously, thoughts with the alleged victim and family. So a bit of perspective here. Worst things happen at sea, as they say. But it was a distressing weekend. I can't deny it for me and others uh, falsely named. Today, I'm having further conversations with the police in terms of malicious communication and with lawyers in terms of defamation. defamation. In terms of defamation laws, that's why Nikki Campbell has contacted the police in this instance. That's right. I mean, I mean it, again, it's quite difficult. The police would quite rightly be able to look at that and see if, uh, if something has been said that is particularly egregious under a malicious communication. But then also he could go to the civil courts and make a libel claim against people. I think Jeremy Vine said, you know, how could, what can we do? You know, can you make 85 different libel claims? Because so many people not only tweet it, but then retweet it. Um, and that is the problem with uh, social media speculation, with this void of who this uh, person is. Let's talk about the police. There's meant to be a police meeting with BBC bosses today. Do we have any idea what's going to happen in that meeting, when it's going to happen, what do we know about it? Well, what we know is that the BBC only contacted the police on Friday. I spoke to the Met yesterday and they said that's when they had first contact. And I believe it was a contact with an officer. Even the Met Police press office actually didn't know about that contact initially. Um, and so they made their statement on uh, Sunday. And that was when they had an, 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 another contact from the BBC. Uh, and then they said we will have further conversations with the BBC and that's obviously been happening today. Uh, and we expect that then they will go into these criminal allegations because what has been said in The Sun is uh, is criminal. It is illegal to uh, to possess, to ask for, to pay for, to provide images of an explicit nature of someone who is under 18. They cannot consent uh, to sending them, even if they, if it looks like they've they've sent them themselves, that that that's the law, and that's uh, really the difficult difficulty of this allegation. And what the BBC have said, in defence of why it took them two months to get to this stage from the initial a allegation on May the nineteenth, is that what was printed in the Sun was different to what they were told back in May. Uh, they said it was in a different nature. It was new, were their words. What's your assessment of how the BBC have handled this? I think it's really hard to assess how the BBC have handled this at this stage. It doesn't look good that they had this um, happen they, that we, we know and they've, they've accepted that they were told back in May um, and it's taken this much time for a suspension to happen. So we know now that it's serious enough what they know now that someone's been suspended. So it doesn't look good. It may be they say that they have robust processes in place and that they have been looking into this since it was reported in May. Uh, I think we have to see what those processes were, whether they were properly followed. Um, who knew? It's, it's certainly right and proper that some people shouldn't know when, when someone is being investigated for certain allegations, but perhaps should know if those allegations become more serious. Um, they, they suggest, they say that this is complex. The BBC say this is complex and fast moving. So there is a bit of intrigue there as to exactly what they mean by that. Is there something about this that we don't know? So I think it's, I think it's perhaps not right at this stage to come out and criticise anyone at this stage because we don't know enough to say they've acted in the wrong way. But there is there's definitely two shadows looming in this scandal and, and one is the anonymity of the figure but the other is the lack of clarity at this stage as to how the BBC have handled what's happened. And just after I recorded with Jason two updates from the police. The Met says it's not investigating the case of the suspended presenter yet. That's after it met with BBC representatives in an online call. Officers are assessing the information and making further inquiries. And in the other update, they are investigating a report of malicious communication in relation to a social media post. There have been no arrests. I've also been speaking to Roger Bolton, former BBC producer and presenter who now presents the Bee Watch podcast. This is what he told me on the BBC's response. I think it's given an opportunity for the BBC's enemies to kick it. 
there may be arguments about how quickly they responded to these allegations, and we're not sure what they were and when. But they brought in the police very early. It's only seven weeks since they first heard about this. So um, I don't, I mean, it's a crisis. They may be criticised. I don't think it's a massive scandal. It would only be a scandal if the, it was revealed that the BBC knew about this person's activity and chose not to disclose it. Nonetheless, it's deeply embarrassing. The DG sent that email, the internal email that was um, we saw yesterday, and in it he outlined the challenges in handling this. The individual's right to privacy, for one. Um, do you think... We were talking about the timeline. They knew about it in May, and then new allegations on Thursday. But do you think they've been swift and transparent enough? I think it's impossible to know. What I think the BBC will have to do when this is over is publish that and tell us what they knew, when they knew it, and who knew it. Uh, but it may be that the first things they were told was sufficient to want them to explore, but not, not fleshed out in detail. Uh, maybe that on Thursday, when the Director General was informed and when allegedly you know, further allegations were made, the detail came out. So we don't, the truth is we don't know. The BBC may have been quick, it may have been slow, um, but I think what's crucial is that a timeline is published. And, and this should not be difficult. There's got to be photographs, if this is true, and there's got to be payments, very substantial payments and records of them, if it's true. So it shouldn't take long to find both those things. And that should really put an end to it as far as the BBC is concerned. There's the separate question about whether the actions were criminal. They may have been if the person involved was under 18 when indecent photographs were solicited, if they were solicited. So I think that, you know, um, if it's shown that payments were made, uh, that's enough to get the person dismissed from the BBC. It's a separate question about whether there is sufficient evidence for a criminal prosecution. One of the things that the son alleges was that the mother of this individual came forward to them and uh, didn't want any payment for the story because she had seen the BBC presenter on air after they had made the allegations or they had made, um, or they, they'd contacted the Beeb. Do you think that that presenter should have stayed on air after May 19th? You can't just say because there's an allegation, we're going to damage your career, take you off air, increase suspicions, get the press back on you. You've got to have some evidence that, it, that the allegations are substantial. And then you've got to decide what you, you've got a responsibility. The, the person should be innocent and proven guilty. You've got to have their privacy, respect their privacy. On the other hand, you have got to have the most rigorous investigation. So it may be that the BBC is at fault. It may be that the BBC didn't pursue these things sufficiently quickly. Uh, but it may be the BBC has behaved entirely properly in this. All we know is uh, the two things, aren't they? One is you put BBC sex and cover up in a headline, bang, off it goes. And that we are, however much we say we're terribly serious about this, we all want to know these things. And there are some things we should not know uh, until they have been substantially supported by the evidence. The internet is a wonderful thing, but it's full of lies and it's full of defamation. And in future, I fear, it will be full of AI and deep, deep fake videos. So we must be careful not to rush to judgment. But the BBC is paid for by the licence fee payers. It must be transparent about what it's done. Uh, and we'll see. But at the moment, I think the BBC's crisis is passing for the BBC. It's now in the hands of essentially the police and the agent and presenter involved. Mm. And uh, the BBC's remaining obligation, I think, is to pre present us with a full and detailed account of what they knew, when they knew it, and what they did about it. I want to pick up on what you said about the licence fee and who pays for the BBC. Do you think this is a massive test of trust in the BBC? Well, I think, it's a I think it is a test of trust, but this goes on all the time. Remember, the BBC is highly unpopular with the Conservative Party in large parts of the media, who love putting the boot in. I mean, look at people like Priti Patel, Nadine Doris, and so on. Oh, Piers Morgan, you know, any opportunity, it doesn't matter what, what the evidence is, kick the beam. Now, BBC should be kicked on occasions, and I've certainly kicked them. But, you know, it's an alien atmosphere. It's, it's a hostile atmosphere to it. Um, but when you look at this... Uh, 
the worst they can have done in this instance is not um, in the seven weeks since they knew that initial um, uh, allegation was made that they hadn't acted quick enough. That's concerning. But they know there's no evidence they've tried to hide anything. So I do not believe this is a massive scandal unless you can prove either that BBC knew about this person's activities and did nothing about it and let them continue to broadcast, or if the BBC was told something about it and then didn't take appropriate action quickly. There's no evidence yet, anyway, either of those apply. Therefore, to call it a massive scandal, it's unfortunate, it's uncomfortable, but I'm afraid it goes with the fact that BBC does get kicked now and again and occasionally deserves it. But actually, can you imagine any other media organisation doing better? Do you think trying. it's going to have ramifications on their annual report? We, we're due to see it tomorrow. Well, I think it'll be tough for the Director General to get the press's uh, media's attention to on anything other than this particular issue. He'll have to deal with it out front. He'll have to make a statement as uh, possible. But if you were, you know, if, if, if the annual report was part of, shall we say, a BBC media uh, PR offensive in which they're trying to say what good value for money they are and what they're doing, whatever, then it's a nightmare because, you know, we all know what will happen tomorrow at the press conference. We all know what the first question will be and the second and the third. So it'll be tough. Do you yeah. think it'll go ahead? Would you want to have your um, executives in that position where the, the press are there and they can be asked anything? Well, first of all, I'd take the view and have all the time when I was doing feedback for Ready For is that that goes with it. You have the licence fee. The shareholders are the listeners and the viewers, and they have the right to ask questions. And you have to accept if you get take a job at the top of the BBC where you're paid less than you are paid, say, Channel 4 or elsewhere, but still played pretty well. You've just you've got to put up with it. This is the price. But I think people should recognise that there are very few, if any, organized broadcasting organisations in the world that are as open uh, as the BBC. They make mistakes. By heaven, they make mistakes. And they need a kicking occasionally. And yet, well, you still I, don't think. I haven't seen anything else who suggests to me that this is that serious, to be honest. Even, I think maybe in three months' time, we'll be looking back and wondering did we get all slightly out of proportion? Even though it could mean, still allegations, still reportedly, that one of their biggest stars is involved in illegal activity. Yes, it could do, but, you know, human beings are very strange. I used to work with a guy called Frank Boff, 20, 30, well, actually 30 years ago now, 40 years, or 35 years ago. Frank Boff was the most popular presenter, probably in the country, certainly one of the most popular anywhere on the BBC. He did sport, whatever. Sometime after he left the BBC, um, he was found to go, go into a brothel, dressed as a woman, and taking drugs. I talked to him Brit after it. He just said he had a complete breakdown, whatever. Nobody could have guessed that. We're all strange. We all have secrets. And to say because you've been a, presented on the BBC, it's somehow the BBC is, is responsible for your private life. But you can't blame an organisation that employs somebody for that. You can blame them if they don't do due diligence. And if they don't, when they're hearing of serious concerns, uh, pursue them. And if they don't make it absolutely clear to all members of their staff that that sort of behaviour is unacceptable. But I don't think any organisation can police the mind of its presenters. We'll be back on Tuesday with more reaction to the fallout. But for now, you can get the latest on Sky News across our socials and on the Sky News app. This episode was produced by Annie Joyce with Alex Eden. The editor is Paul Stanworth.